Good evening, everybody. Hi, Joey. Hi. Why don't we stand as we get ready to pray and enter into worship tonight? The first song we're doing tonight, it's called Heal Our Land, and it's whether personal or corporate, I think it's going to be a very relevant cry for us tonight. Um, before we go into it, though, I want to read a little bit of scripture. So 2 Chronicles 7, 13 through 16, this is out of the modern English version. When I shut up the heavens and there is no rain, or when I command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence on my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer of this place. So now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name will be there continually. My eyes and heart will be there for all days. And I know that that's a verse that gets quoted often, at least that, that middle part. But there's so many layers to that. That first layer, when I shut up the heavens and there's no rain, or when I command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence on my people. In other words, if life sucks, if everything is going wrong, if there seems to be no hope, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and will hear their land. So no matter what, it looks like he will do that. However, the second layer is not if my people who feel justified in their complaining, it's not if my people who feel they've done no wrong or have had no part in the land that they're praying for being the way that it is. It's if my people will call, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, not stand firm in their righteous religious ways, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land, heal their, heal their land. goodness. Then after all of that, he says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer of this place. Now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name be there continually. My eyes and heart will be there for all days. So Lord God, tonight, we come before you and we humbly seek your face and we bow before you and we repent. We surrender. We repent for any part we've had to play in whatever circumstances we're going through. Whether it's our personal lives, whether it's, it's the life in, in this world, what, whatever it is, we come to you and we just say, God, we repent. We repent for our, for our part. We take, we take responsibility for our part. Heal us transform us, mold me, shape me. And then we say, God, won't you come and just touch this situation? Won't you come and just let your spirit fill the room and fill the earth? Won't you come and do what you do best, God? But first we come and we just say thank you for all you are. We come and we give ourselves as pure and holy vessels unto you surrendered for you to do whatever you want. We come tonight and we worship and we pray and we get in your word because we want to be ready for what you want to do. We want to be ready for the healing. We want to be ready for our part. So Lord God, we come and we cry out tonight in one accord with one voice. Thank you, Jesus.
to do exactly what we're singing. As we get out of the way, Like you breathed on the disciples. Breathe on us. Breathe on us and send us out. That's what we're here for.
church, isn't that good? Father, I pray that in this room, or if we're watching on our online platforms, Lord God, that we be reminded that you're still on the throne. You're still king of all kings. You still hold us in the palm of our hands, and, and we begin to speak to every situation that may be in front of us, every giant, every mountain that may be for us, and we remind that giant and that mountain that we serve a God that's victorious, that he's holy, he's righteous, he's still on the throne. He's not dead in a grave, but he's risen and alive today. Yeah. And know the world that we live in is with perversion and all the things, how the enemy's trying to move and cause all the problems in our world and, and discredit the things. Lord, we serve a God that even in the midst of today's day, you're still the God of all gods. You're still the king of all kings. You're still greater and bigger than anything the enemy has to offer. So, Lord, I thank you. I pray that if there's something in this room, somebody in this room that has a mountain or has a giant or who's in a storm, that they'll begin to call out those things even right now. Lord, here's my giant. Here's my mountain. Here's my storm. Here's the thing that I seem that's distracting me from the purpose and the mission that you've called me to have. And right now, Lord, we call out that victorious risen king to come to that giant to come to that mountain, to come and cause peace in the middle of the storm because we serve a God that's greater and bigger than any.
any of those things. Come on, church, it's a time right now. You have an opportunity right now to call out and say, Lord, here's this that I'm going through. Here's this giant. Here's this financial issue. Here's this relationship issue. Here's whatever it is. It may seem hard, but with you, you are the God of all holiness. You're the God of righteousness. You are the God of victory. And that's the God we're worshiping. That's the God we're proclaiming. That's the God we're shouting about today. So as we sing that chorus one more time, speak to that mountain. Speak to that giant. Speak to that that, that storm in your life. Let's experience freedom in this house today. thank you for the distractions that are going to begin to begin to melt from our minds so we can begin to be so in tune with you lord that we begin to walk where you lead where we're able to hear when you when you call us we're able to take your hand because we know what your hand even looks like lord Lord, you're calling us here at Redemption City. This is a season where you're saying, church, the time of distractions are over. It's time to be who I've called us to be. And so, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing. But, Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. And, Lord, I pray as we get ready to dive into your word this evening, Lord God, that your word becomes alive to us. Let us have a perception that we've never had it before. Let us see something we've never seen before. Let us hear something something that you're trying to say to every individual in this room and right now we tell the enemy as he's trying to fill our minds with things that are going on we just tell the enemy to be quiet this is our father's business so Lord, we honor you we worship you come on church and all god's people say amen you may be seeing this time for our announcements Good evening. It's funny how many times you come up here and you think you have to, you keep wanting to say morning. Oh yeah, I I lost a little weight recently. Uh, (laughs) I know, right? Keep bringing up the tithe slot, and everybody, there it is, way ahead of me, look at you. Um, So as you come in where the announcements are, there's envelopes now, you can put your tithe in that, and it has our, all our stuff on it, and you can still put it in the baskets. Um, you can text to that number up there and then also still send in your tithe if uh, you're somebody that still does that. Um, happening this week is, so Tuesday the 6th at 11. So it's our it's the prayer time with uh, Jeff and JJ. And I'm, I'm assuming still going through praying with over the prodigals and those list of names. Uh, Wednesday is Empowered Through Christ. That's at 7.15, meeting here. Thursday, Life and Death, The Power of Words, meeting at the church at 7. Saturday, there's a senior ice cream social, so that's June 10th, from 5 to 8 at Kathy Abbott's house. Uh, You can see her or Dolores if you have any questions about that. Um, They just asked if each family would bring a side. Everything else is, is provided beyond that. So just bring something that everybody can share and then just show up. And then Sunday, we have prayer uh, before service. Um, And that's really just an atmosphere for you to settle into 
really just settle into the into worship time and let go of everything that happened to the previous week. We you know we're talking about distractions. It's a great opportunity to lay the distractions at the altar before service even starts. So your mind's right to receive. And then, of course, service starts at 6. Um, the last thing is that the uh, Independence Day celebra- celebration will be happening uh, Sunday, July 2nd. Church is going to start at 3. And then uh, church cookout immediately following food, uh, fun, and games. Uh, grab your cornhole tournament partners. <clears throat> I was going to be mean, but I'm still going to say it. I was going to catch myself and be like, go down, go down, Jeff. <laughs> I didn't play last year. I'm going to play this year. <laughs> um, so I think that's it unless I missed anything. Okay. Back to you, Bob. <laughs> well, today we have the privilege of honoring our graduates, so I'm going to ask if Hannah and Sadie would come up front and join me. This is their favorite part of the day, I'm sure. And here in a minute, the first thing I want to do, the most important part for you all, outside of the prayer, is the board got together and we like to honor and do something for each one of our graduates. Honorly put up a thing in the back for you both. Uh, There'll be cupcakes and stuff after service. If you want to love on them, give them some money or do anything, there's stuff in the back for them as well so we can help celebrate them as well. Uh, But the board and I, we always get together every year and we want to give you all a little card with a little gift in it. So there's from our, from me and the church board. And I just have a couple quick questions, and you can ask one, and you can just pass it down. So what's one thing you're going to miss about high school? Uh, Just the people, really. Um, Just, yeah. (laughs) I would have said nothing. Go ahead. ahead. (laughs) Well, there was this really good salad in the cafeteria. (laughs) With amazing homemade honey mustard dressing. It was only three dollars. Somebody make Sadie some salad with it. Come on, we got to do better. It's like gourmet. Come on, no. Okay, second question, and it may. This doesn't have to be big or theological. What's something you're planning to do now that you have officially graduated? Um, I mean, I'm just going to go to I'm going to college. I'm going to Columbus State. Columbus so, State. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, so that's that's the next biggest thing. Yeah. Very good. I'm going to Zumbi Bay at some <laughs> point. <laughs> um, I'm thinking. Zumbi Bay. <laughs> it's a water park. Well, I'm going to take a gap year. Though recently I went to a graduation party and I thought it was going to be really awkward, but then a lady started talking to me, so I might take one one class at Columbus State this year, even though it's technically my gap year. But and then I'm probably going to go to Columbus State too. <clears throat> okay, this is the most important part, church, so I need you all to get your pens and papers out. This is, this is honestly the most important. This is where we as a church need to make sure we begin to do this. So listen, Hannah, what's, one, that, what's a way that we as your church body could pray for you as you move into your new season, could be about going to school, could be about anything, but how as a church family could we pray for you? Somebody write this down because I'm expecting you all to begin to pray for them. Um, mostly just that I'm able to keep myself motivated. I struggle with that, so. I felt that. <laughs> I guess I'd, I would like you to pray that I don't get into debt because I hate debt, and I like to save and hold on to my money as much as I can. (laughs) I don't want to live a life of debt, and I want to not waste it on the wrong things. So. 
All right. Obviously, we'll pray for them more than that. Now what would we like to do, what I like to do, I'm going to ask if family would like to come up, and if you'd like to join, Sadie and Hannah, come up here and join. You want to surround them? We'll have you come up here so that way it's not awkward. Or, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Eric and Anna Lee. Um, there are youth pastors here. They've known them for a long time. And I want you to pray over Hannah and Sadie. So when we get to the pray, if you'll lift your hands out and let's pray a blessing over them because it's exciting to graduate high school, but it's a new journey. And we want to make sure that they know they're loved here and that we're praying for them as God directs them in their beginnings. Amen. Amen. All right. So Hannah, I know that this is a big deal for you to be standing up here. You're in, inside, you're, you're like shaking because you've, you've shared some of the, these struggles, but I want to call forth the woman of boldness that God, God has called you to be. So we talk like, well, I'm going to go to Columbus State. There's no little dreams in God's kingdom. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm speaking over you is that the boldness, the lioness arises in you, that people see the, thing that, the, the things that God has for you in the future. So dream big. Now's the time to do it. Don't take a step back. We're like, oh, this seems hard. Dream big. Those doors will open for you. Oh, my goodness, Sadie. You have to be one of my favorite people I've ever taught. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You talk something about Sadie, and one time she'll just go, why? Like, <laughs> and you want to go, well, because I said so, but that doesn't work. And so made me teach the teens better, but, but Sadie, there's nothing wrong with relaxing. Deep breath, rest. The Sabbath, we call it the shalom peace. Uh, so... In your time that you take time off, number one, don't feel guilty about it. Uh, I, I, I forced Jamie to take a year off. I told him, I said, you're too high strung. And that's not what I'm saying about you, but please make sure that the Shabbat, that rest comes naturally. God can pour into you. And the things, the dreams that you have are his dreams. Because I've heard you speak prophecy in places like Kroger boldly right? And so you have the gift of prophecy and the ability to speak in other people's lives. And, and you're going to be planted in a place to where when people encounter you, you're going to say, that person's been in God's presence, okay? So Father God, right now, we remind these two young ones, although they've, they've, they've hit a milestone, they've not finished the race. We've just taken an extra step. And now, God... I, I, I ask that you increase their mantle. That, Father God, that as they age, that they realize that not only do they get to leave the childish things behind, they no longer drink the formula and things like that, and they start to dive into the eating of the spiritual meat, right? So the things that we step forward, and Father God, that we ask that you put a bountiful amount of your presence in their life. Let them feel the anointing that they have. Let the anointing oil just flow over them to where they feel it dripping off their chin and things like that. Let them carry the fragrant aroma of Holy Spirit wherever they go. And Father, right now I ask that, number one, that they, they shut their ears to, the, uh, the, to the, the desires and the sirens of the world. Because right now, we stand in a society right now where it's like 80 to 90%. Once kids leave high school, they leave the church. And so, Father God, number one, we speak against that. That, number one, that you plug their ears from things other than you are whispering into them. And Father, that their yes is yes and their no is no that you lead them to where you want them to go, even walking on water, the things that seem impossible. So as a youth pastor, I'm really proud of you, Sadie, and you, Hannah, the things that you stepped out of your comfort zones quite a bit. And you spoke boldly, and you were the great example of the godly people that God has called you to be. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Remember, cupcakes and blessings after the church. See how we do the blessing? All right. Next thing I have, um, Jeff Miller going to talk about his son and what his trip coming up in July. Thank you, Thank you. Good evening. 
I wanted to thank everybody that donated. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody that donated to his trip so far. Um, I wanted to share a few things and give some details so you guys aren't in the dark and you don't think that you're just sending them on a you know 12 day vacation somewhere in Africa. <laughs> so uh, we partnered with a, a, a ministry called CBM Ministries. It's Committed Believers Ev Evangelical Ministry. Um, he is going to Kenya, Africa, and the various cities that he is going to be in is Malindi, Wotamu, and Midikaraka. Uh, forgive me if I didn't pronounce any of those uh, correctly. Um, they mainly speak Swahili, where he's going to be going. They are helping with a church plant in one of the so-called bush area of Midikaraka. That's where they're going to be for a majority of their time. They're going to be ministering in a couple of orphanages and Christian schools for children that the CBM sponsors and has, and a couple of orphanages that the CBM, CBEM has also. Um, it's, this is very, very God-led, and it's a, it's a yes in our heart to send our son. It's a yes in my son's heart, and we want to send him properly because we don't just go. We want to have that check in our heart, and we want our church body praying for us as we go on that trip. Now, this is a, 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 big, a big trip for him. This will be his first one. He's been uh, overseas with us, obviously, but this is his first one by himself. One of the biggest prayer requests that I could ask of is that there's traveling mercies, because it is a 28-hour 28 uh, 28 travel time from the time that he leaves the States. There's four different layovers in three different nations. So it's, it's a big trip, it's a big flight. In order to keep costs down, there had to be those layovers. Um, so while he's there, they're going to be ministering in the schools and the orphanages, like I said, and in Midi Karaka, they're working with a pastor that has started churches in different villages in that area. And they're gonna be doing a grand opening and they're gonna pr be providing food and medical supplies for the villagers that live around that church. Um, and we believe in, in our mission and in the ministry as we go, we don't go to really conquer the land and start a Western church or to start an American uh, missionary type thing. They go and we go to build up pastors of that community and they begin to plant churches outside of their community and they begin to multiply. So, because it's, again, it's not about us, it's about the kingdom. So just pray as, jo as Jonathan is going that the rest of his finances would come um, through, the, through the body of Christ. Um, he's just a few bucks short uh, of the total goal that we wanted, that he needed to be able to go. Um, pray that the medical team would, would be a huge blessing to that community and they would see healings of diseases and healings of uh, whatever issues that these people may have. Um, also, in Malindi and Watamu, they're actually going to church services for healing, for healing services. Um, all the disabled in the different villages and all throughout the bush will travel several hundred miles walking on crutches or in wheelchairs th through the, you know, the desert terrain and everything to get there to, to be healed. And they're, they're hungry to be healed. So pray that the, the hand of God, the Spirit of God would move so mighty that my son and everybody else on the team would see people grow limbs, people regain their eyesight, people regain their hearing, and see these miracles to be a blessing to these people, and that they would see that their God, it, that our God is the real deal, and that he is alive. And uh, because there's a lot of different religions out there, some of the biggest religions in those three areas is uh, Muslim, uh, Buddhism, and uh, animism, where they believe that everything has a spirit. And so when we minister to those that believe that there's a spirit in everything, they might receive Jesus, but they'll just add that with all the other spiritual things that they believe. But we want that to be that Jesus Christ is the only, is the only thing that you worship and the only spirit that's there. So as uh, we move forward from here, I'm sharing from my son because he's working right now and he's out of state and he's trying to save up his money so that he can get all the supplies and everything that he needs for this trip. So again, I wanted to thank you guys for being a faithful body of Christ. I want to thank you guys for sending him because you guys are part of this and you guys that have sowed into it and are praying and are uh, you know, sowing in financially, you guys will reap benefits and rewards for this as well in the kingdom. So 
I just wanted to say thank you. We're honored to be, sent, to be sending him, and we're honored to be part of this body of Christ. So I appreciate all of your prayers, and I appreciate everything else that you guys are doing. Uh, if you're interested, I have prayer cards that give specific prayer requests for this trip, and they'll be out on the back table. So thank you for your time. I don't have a specific itinerary yet because they're still working out all of the final details because they're working out their flights. Um, that won't be until like a couple weeks before the actual day they leave because of the flights. So then they'll know when they get into town and then where they're going to go from there. So. Thank you. If you ever feel like it, you could... Um Johnny is a lifeguard right now in Indiana Beach, and uh, so <laughs> if you ever go to Indiana Beach, just whistle for the kid whistling his, uh, his whistle, and that's probably Johnny. Stop running! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he is. He's cute, and uh, I'm sure he likes hearing his uncle say he's cute, but anyways... <laughs> Uh, we can have fun in the house of the Lord, amen. I want to I want to share something with you, Christian. If you um, could just be with me for a second, uh, I was in the garage. I was actually coming out to the garage. Raquel and I were working. Actually, she was working on a project, and this came to me. And I want to share this now. This is about marriage. I shared this uh, in our marriage chat. Uh, but this is not just about marriage, and I'll explain why here in a second. Christian, if you put that first slide, it's, it's actually kind of interesting. It says, adultery ends a lot of marriages, but what is that? Ends what? Hear me. See, the world will teach you that adultery and all these things are the reason why marriages are failing today. It's not true. What's failing? Idolatry. What do you mean by that, Pastor Jeff? Look, the number one cause of divorce is not sex, finances, or even kids. The number one cause of divorce is worship of what? Now, stay right there, Christian. The number one distraction you have in your life, in your, in your walk with Christ, probably is your worship of self. Because if God doesn't respond this way, then he doesn't love me. If God allows this to happen, then it shows that God's not a God of love. If, and we put all these things. So self becomes the issue that we have in our relationship with God. So although self, worship of self is the number one cause of divorce, self, I would say, is the number one separation of us and God, which, by the way, is divorce because we're the bride and he's the bridegroom the antidote for divorce in almost every case I notice I said almost every case is for both people someone say both people it's not just his fault and it's just not her fault it's for both people because it takes two people, not just one, to get off their throne and to get on the altar. If one person's doing it and the other one's not, it's not going to work. Just honesty. Get off your throne Angie actually talked about getting on the altar today at marriage class, and I laughed because I got wrecked me with this before Angie. We have this weird telekinesis thing that happens a lot of times. She is my sister. Yeah. So, hear me. The antidote for everything you're going through in your life is to get off your throne and to get on the altar. But Pastor Jeff, I'm struggling with whatever that thing is 
requires you to get off your throne and to allow him to be on the throne. You hear me? Not one person saying, you're not loving me well. See, this is from men, uh, women need to be loved and men need to be respected. Everybody's heard that, I'm sure. Not one saying, you're not loving well, so you need to get on the altar. No one else has ever done that here, have they? Or the other one say, you're not respecting me well, so now you need to get on the altar. It requires both people to get off their throne and get on the altar. It even works this way. God, you didn't answer the way I think you should, so once you get yourself fixed and answer it the way I want you to, then we'll be good, and I'll be back running. I'll be at church. I'll tithe again, pastor. Hallelujah. <laughs> you understand what? Do you see the, what happens? So distraction number one is your throne. Here's another one. The biggest, the second biggest distraction I think in the world today is your what? This is what blew me away. People average seven hours a day of screen time. Whoa! That's a lot of screen time. If you sleep eight hours of a day, Hey, you all prayed for me that I would get more rest. I averaged six and a half hours of sleep this week. Thank you. That's probably why I'm shouting a lot more today than I was last week. So that's your fault. <laughs> if people average seven, uh, now come on church, you, you've been in restaurants and what do you see? It makes me laugh every time. And we're guilty, I'm guilty of it too. We go to a restaurant, we sit down with somebody and the very first thing we do is do this. And what makes me laugh is I went to a, a, a young, sorry, you young generation people. I went to these young kids that were sitting at a table, and they're all laughing. And I'm like, okay, I've been watching y'all, not creepy, just watching, and they laughed at that. And I said, can I ask you what you all are laughing? Because everybody's laughing, but nobody's talking to each other. Everybody's on their phone. And they're saying, well, yeah, we're talking, we're texting each other. That's why we're laughing. But you're right there. Why do you got to take? I, I don't understand it. See? <laughs> Would you agree that the phone is the biggest distraction in our world today? Look at this, Gen Z. So from 1997 to 2013. That's not a lot of us, but there's some. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Average nine hours a day of screen time. <laughs> the amount of time on the screen has gone up about 50 minutes a day every year since 2013. So next year, it will be what? 10 years. 10 years. Right, if every year this 50 minutes, if right now is nine, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I get this right because I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> and and I, I thought I had it, but my generation, which is the millennials, what, what years are millennials? 1980 to 1997, right? Or six, whatever. That's my generation. I'm not 80. I'm a little bit above 80, so thank you. Some of you are shocked that I'm in the, in the millennial category. Millennials, <laughs> hey, 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 I want the card back, Hannah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Man, it's the gray beard, babe. I got to shave it, but when I shave it, you got to say I look funny. Anyways. My generation, millennials, average right now seven hours a day of screen time. And, and, and this is how I justify when I read that, I justified it with the Lord. But Lord, I spend time on it because that's where my Bible's at. And so I read my Bible. The, the problem with Apple is it has this stupid thing called screen time. And it breaks down what you're actually looking at. 
And so the Lord then says, oh yeah, go look and see what your screen time is and what you're actually looking at. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to do it. You do it. I'm not doing it. You do it. I'm not. You know why it's hard to be intimate in a marriage, how it's hard to be intimate in relationships, how it's hard to be intimate, period. It's because we're more intimate with a phone than we are a person. Come on, how many of us could honestly say we probably, don't, now don't include sleeping. How many of us would say, I probably spend more time on my phone, if this is true, than I do my spouse in a day? Don't, hey, don't include sleeping, sleeping, or family members, or kids, or whatever. We wonder why we're having such a disconnect problem in our world today. We're wondering why we're so distracted. It seems like when I was a kid, I had ADHD. Now it seems like every kid has ADHD. And I'm like, where does this come from? And, and I'm like, what is going on? And, and, I, and it's true. My mom said that to test me, they'd put me in front of a game console. We won't say which one to put me how old I am. And if the ball would go real slow, back to back, I would be bored. <laughs> right, mom? But if it was something like, boom, 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 got to go, got to go, got to go. Man, I was right there. I was like, hey, hey, here we go, here we go. Ooh, ha, ooh, ha. That's, that is my brain every day. Okay? <laughs> so now imagine the Lord trying to say, hey, Jeff, where, where do I fit in? Well, Lord, I, I gave you some screen time. <laughs> this is the other thing. This is where I think he's mean to me. Then, no, he loves me. He, okay, so I, I really do have these dialogues. <sighs> and I, can, I convince and I say, well, I may not be the full screen time, but I've spent time on the screen but he would say, okay, how much of that has been devoted to me and not other ads or other things popping up and me scrolling through other things while you're, per while you're doing devotionals? Well, that's not fair. My phone is a walking ad. If I talked about something right now, when we got out, I would have an ad about that something right now. Maybe I'll have a couple Bibles on my ads and they'll get them. And, and then I would put on music. Now, this is not bad for people who like to have worship, but what I realized is when I would put on worship music to really get spiritual and to really dive into my word, because of my, what I have, distraction issues, I would end up doing worship and forget that I'm supposed to be studying and praying and spending time with the Lord. So here's my time with the Lord to be quiet, to allow him to download and to speak to me because, you know, he still speaks to us today, Right? The problem is most of us don't know our father's voice because, anyways, all right. So I'm spending this time. I'm like, Daddy, speak to me. But I got all these songs going on in my head. I'm like, ooh, I remember that one. Ooh, we got to do this Sunday. Joey, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Can we do this song? Right? I do that a lot. And it's like, squirrel, squirrel, where do you get that from? Well, I'm probably doing my devotions at that time. What's happening? I'm distracted. If I'm distracted... I don't know my daddy. I say this all the time. Being adopted, if my biological father walks in the door and says hello and he comes up and he talks to me, I would never know he was my biological father because there was no investment. But Everett Clay, I could tell you his very shadow I knew if I was in trouble. If I heard his voice, I knew my father's voice. Because there was an intimate time spent with my daddy. And sometimes we say, well, God's just not talking like he used to back in the day. God never stopped talking. We just don't know his voice anymore. We're too distracted. Let me give you one more. <laughs> 
Christian, do you know how to add scripture? Probably not. All right, everybody get your Bibles out to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. This is not up there. It's the only time I'll say, get on, on your tablets. We'll see if I can find, okay. Screen time, yeah. <laughs> Man, and I know my kids are going to really mess with me on that one. You are not allowed to take, never mind. New Living, Colossians chapter 3. Is that the right one? No, that's not the right one. It's, it's, no. Nah. Chapter 3, Christians, chapter 3. There you go. Good job, puppy. So before we get into this, hear, you, hear me really quick. Your perspective has got to change. Your perspective can be a distraction. Let me give you something. Hmm. This may upset. Hmm. June 28th, 2022 was the day my father went home to be in glory. It was a Tuesday. Sean and I were on the fifth hole golfing. June 26th, or June 27th was a Monday. I would always go down and I would see my dad every other day. The Sunday before, so June 25th, June 26th, sorry, that Sunday, Pastor Allen and I were talking. I said, you know, my dad, they kept telling us every day, say goodbye, this is it. Say goodbye, this is it. Say, right, Mom, every day. But he wouldn't go away. He kept holding on. I went to church that Sunday and Pastor Allen was asking me how my dad was. I don't know if you remember this. I said, well, he's still holding on. What if God wants to heal my dad? What if, what if, what if what's happening is that he's holding on because the miracle statement that would come out is if Everett Clay came back when everybody else said that he was going to die and walked out, out of that room, could you imagine the testimony that happened? So that Sunday, I was excited. I was like, man, I'm going to go Monday. I'm going to get my mom out of the room. I'm going to lay hands on my dad, and I'm going to call his body to come alive again. Monday comes, and my mom and I would always go out to eat after I spent some time with my dad in the morning. And uh, I remember I was so excited. I was so excited because I went over to his bed. He just laid there, no, no nothing, no, no talking. He couldn't talk to you. He couldn't acknowledge you. He was just there. I remember praying for him. Laying my hands on my dad, telling his body to wake up, come alive, walk out of here, shock mom, shock the world. Let's tell about a miracle. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and nothing happened. Has anybody ever been there before? My mom calls me on Tuesday to tell me my dad is gone. And I did probably what most of us who are too religious will never admit that we did, but I did it. I immediately blamed God. He took my dad. I know none of you have ever been there. And I was angry. He laid there for two weeks. 
You, I, know you to, I know you told me to pray for him. I know you told me to pray for healing over I, I This wasn't crazy. Some of you are like, that's crazy, Pastor. It's not crazy. I, we've prayed for people and seen crazy things before. God's still in that business, by the way. And I was angry. And for months and months, I was angry. I'm like, God, you didn't heal. Now, now you, you didn't heal my dad. I, I, I'm a fool. I can't tell anybody I prayed for healing for my dad. Because if I told people I prayed for my dad, they're like, I don't want him to pray for me. He doesn't have any power. And like, that's what the enemy does. He puts all this garbage and all these thoughts and all these things on us and about why God failed and why he's not real and why is God not all these things. And that's where I what? I'm just being, can I be honest today? And I'm, I was, <laughs> I was fighting through it. To one day I got a revelation. He said, Jeff, your perspective of me stinks. What? Change your perspective. Your perspective is that he wasn't healed. My perspective is he's eternally healed, no longer suffering. But, but you told me to pray. You, I know I wasn't dumb. I wasn't naive. I mean, come on. You told me. No, 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 no. Sometimes it's an obedience thing. But even though you prayed, Jeff, the perspective, the answer was the same. I healed him. And then what happened was the very next day, my mom doesn't even know this. We, my mom and I have breakfast together every Wednesday. We do breakfast together at Aladdin's in, um, in Granville. It's great. They have loved our business. Um, <laughs> their hamburgers are amazing. Okay. And my mom's talking to me. And she says, Jeffrey, do you realize the quality of life that your dad would have had if he would have survived? <sighs> yeah, but he'd be here. I could complain to him right now. In, in your head, that's what you're saying. I'm not going to tell my mom that. My dad loved to eat. He loved food. Right, Mama? He was a diabetic, but he just said he didn't care. He survived cancer, and diabetes wasn't going to kill him. He was going to eat. And he would eat. We'd eat cheese pizzas. He'd make the best homemade ice cream ever. I mean, he, it just, he loved to eat. But what happened was he couldn't eat because of the esophagus cancer. And so he got a, a bag in his stomach. And so all he could do, a man who loved food, all he could do was smell the food but never taste the food. So much that my mom didn't even want to, to uh, begin to cook food in the house because she didn't want my dad to have to suffer. It'd be like me taking me to Wendy's but saying, you can't eat. You got to sit there. No, I'd be mad. <laughs> Last time I thought about Wendy's, someone blessed us with a $10 gift card. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just teasing. We're not getting Wendy's. I can't chew. And we're talking about the quality of life that he would have had. And then I realized he's eating manna better than I've ever tasted before. There's no thing in his stomach. He's healed. He's walking. He's free. And he's right where he wanted to be all along. But my perception stunk. A lot of times, church, our perception is wrong. Colossians 3 says, if then you have been what? So any believers in the house say amen. It says, seek the things that are what? Where Christ is. See, I'm being honest. I'm, be, I'm being transparent. All I know to be is transparent. I need you to get this. My eyes, even though I was praying for a healing, I realized that I also had a little hidden agenda because I wasn't ready for my dad to go yet. Right? 
But if my eyes were raised with Christ, where he's seated at the right hand of the God, maybe my perception would have been different and I would have held resentment. Maybe if you realized that who God is and where he is and what he's doing and who, if you would change your perception and see things where he sees things, maybe you would get through a situation or a storm, but we don't, we get stuck because our eyes are here. Peter began to sink when his eyes went away from the Father. Set your minds on things that are what? Not on things that are on what? (laughs) For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Next slide. Is that it? That can't be it. Oh, he's just going to go on. No, I can't find it. Good job, Christian. Think about the things. Verse 2 says, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life. I love that. And your real life is hidden With Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you then will share in all of his glory. Not suffering, glory. Perspective. So my question to you today is what are what's your perspective? What are some things that are distracting you? That, that thing, I'm just being honest with you, that thing literally caused me to, to shriek back and hide so much that I would say, Lord, help me that I could actually pray and know who I am. You could say, Pastor Jeff, that's crazy. You should know who you are. Sure, you should know who you are. These are all things that we tell you. And then the church, we say, oh, you're all these great and mighty things. But the truth is, we're suffering and struggling in places, but nobody wants to talk about it. Or we don't realize that there is a freedom. I can stand here and preach now, knowing that I have a Father's Day to preach in a couple weeks, knowing that my dad's one year's coming up, but I can do it from a different perspective because my eyes are no longer here. My eyes are here. If my eyes were still here, then my whole life would still be shattered. Not that it doesn't hurt. Doesn't mean I don't miss my dad. Doesn't mean I won't still listen to 10 different voicemails about my father. Doesn't mean those things. But what it means is I can now celebrate in his one year knowing that that's one year that he's got to be with Jesus and he's not suffering anymore doesn't change the fact that I won't miss him. doesn't change the fact that it doesn't hurt, that he's not here. It just changes that my eyes are no longer here. It's there. Pastor Jeff, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did I lose this job? Why did this happen to me? What was this? And, and every time I realized in my life is perspective is a big issue. When Jesus was sleeping in the boat and they were in the storm and the disciples were panicking and they wake up, what are you doing? Jesus was sleeping. Why? Because his perspective was he knew that he wasn't going to drown and God wasn't going to do anything. But the disciples' perspective was, we're going to die. We're going to drown. So even in the midst of storms, in lives, in mountains, what's your perspective? Change your eyes on the kingdom and not on the earth. Sound good? So here's my challenge to you as the worship team comes up. Wow, it's already 725. I wonder if we could, number one, acknowledge, are any of us struggling with being on the throne today? Am I on the throne? Is there anything that's, that's distracting me from my purpose and who God's called me to be? Is there some things I need to lay at the altar today? The second thing is, 
all right, pastor, are there things, not just the phone, is there things in my life that if I was to be honest are taking up way more time than my time with the Lord and my time with my family? My dad used to tell me all the time, my first ministry is my family. If I can't minister to my family, I can never minister to my church. But you know what happens a lot of times? We're great at ministering to the church, but our families get destroyed because the enemy distracts and he distracts and he distracts. The last question I have for you today is what's your perspective this evening? Is there anything that God's saying, hey, you're seeing it as this, but let me tell you how I see it. I, I, I struggled about a month ago. I was struggling. It seemed like we were getting hit all over the place, over and over and over. And when you're in the storms and when, when life happens and things happen, you're like, come on, Lord, when's my, what's going on? And, and, but the thing that God reminded me over and over is, Jeff, there's a whole lot of harvest and victory just on the other side. Change your perspective. But I complain because I don't want to go through this stuff. <laughs> My dad used to always tell me that people will appreciate it more when they invest in it themselves than if you give them something. When you invest into something, you appreciate it. Where if I give you something, you're like, thank you, but you may not have the same value as if you worked hard for it. When, if God was just to give us everything in the world, <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. But what God's promised us is that when we're in the fire, in the storm, in the hardest times, in those moments where we're like, Lord, I can't take any more. In those moments, he's promised us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. The problem with us, the body, the church, not just our church, the global church, is we forget that he's never left. He's always been there. God, where are you at? How come you abandoned me? How come you left me? How come I can't hear from you? How come this? How come? No, 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 no. He's never left. You've just quit listening. What distractions do you have this evening? What's keeping you from being the son or daughter that God's called you to be this evening? Would you stand as we worship?
Lord, there's two things. Quiet my heart. I'm listening is in a place of reverence, in a place where we can recognize our Father's voice. And, and Lord, I pray that in this room, and, and whether we're here or we're watching online, Lord God, that we will begin to be able to hear your voice in a way we've never heard it before. We'll be able to know your leading like we've never knew it before. There'll be a sense of newness that just begins to fall on every person here listening, Lord, that's like, wow, this is like a different relationship, a different this category. This is some new wineskin stuff that I've never experienced in and through you, Lord, and I pray that that will be an encounter that we have, Lord, and an encounter, but not just an encounter, but an experience and, and something that we experience daily. You give it to us daily, Lord God, but there's a second part part of this song that just wrecks me. It says, trust, I trust you. It's that trust. It's this moment where we say, Lord, we're going to trust your perception. We're going to trust what you're saying. We're going to trust you in our mountains. We're going to trust you in our seasons. We're going to trust you in our storms. We're going to trust you where we are, Lord God. And it's this crying out moment, Lord, where we have a moment and an opportunity to say, Lord, in this, Lord, I trust you. I lift my hands off. I'm getting off the throne. I'm trusting you in this right now, Lord. Lord, may we be a church that says we refuse to be distracted. We have a mission. We have a purpose. We're here to be a part of a great revival and a part of a great expanding of the kingdom of God. You want to use every individual in this room. It's not just one person. It's just not a few. But you called, equipped, and called and breathed life into every individual in this room or watching online for a purpose and for that to expand your kingdom of God. Lord, I just pray we refuse. Redemption City refuses to be distracted. We refuse to be distracted. We want to have Redemption City, a powerful, we named it Redemption City, but we want to be a part of a vocal thing that we share to our community. Let us share about the redemptive quality in who God is and who his son is and how his son died but rose again. There's a redemptiveness, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we refuse, we refuse to be distracted. We trust you. Our perception, we trust you. We trust you. This, come on, church, do you trust him today? I trust you. Lord, I, I trust you greater than I've ever trusted you before. If there was ever a season that you could say, man, I was really in tune. I was really trusting him then. May we repent and say, Lord, I'm thankful for that season. But may this be the season where we say, man, we've never trusted you. And we've never, ever trusted you like we trust you now. And we're allowing you to lead us wherever you call us, Lord. Lead us, not us. May you be lead. But for that, we may be able to hear and recognize our daddy's voice. We honor you today. Come on, church. Wasn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today?